let's try this once again is audio getting through okay 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 so this is lecture 22 right okay <coughs> so the last thing we were seeing was uh, what was the last thing we were seeing okay so neighborhoods of depth l for for a bit node from in an ldpc code in the tanagraph of an ldpc code and then how uh, repetition in the neighborhood as you go along and construct it corresponds to a closed loop or a cycle in your uh, original tanagraph okay so i want to spend some time talking about this neighborhood a little bit because we will we will use it quite often when we describe uh, decoders and analysis etc okay so the first thing i want to do is to think of the neighborhood in the original tanner graph itself okay so how did i draw the neighborhood okay so okay so i want to talk more about these neighborhoods how did i write down the neighborhood you remember i wrote it like a tree right i wrote the node first and then its neighbors its neighbors its neighbors so on okay i never backtracked but i kept on writing like this i said we'll allow repetition in in small cases but in large cases we also said even as n becomes very large as your graph becomes really really large and it's very sparse then i stated a result right i said cycles will not do you remember that result okay so the probability that you'll get a cycle is very very low in fact it decreases it decreases exponentially in n okay <coughs> yeah small yeah small length cycles yeah i think probability decreases maybe i'm i'm not quite right about the exponential in n maybe it's only 1 by n or something okay so i'm not not very sure you may might want to check that but it decreases and it becomes very very small so probability that you get a, a cycle is is not really there okay but you can also think of a neighborhood on the tanner graph itself suppose i have a tanner graph here okay so let me let me spend some time and try to write down a tanner graph Okay, just an approximate version. I have a whole bunch of bit nodes here, and then I have check nodes. Okay. Okay, it goes on like this. That's so, and there are connections, right? So, <coughs> so, so there are few things that are very basic and elementary. So I can reorder the check nodes and bit nodes in any way I want, right? It doesn't change the code or the actual matrix in any way right i can reorder the nodes and on both sides any way i want but i cannot change the placement of the edges if i change the placement of the edges what happens the one actually moves from something to other the code itself changes can change potentially okay so keep that in mind so when talking about neighborhoods it's useful to reorder the nodes as they would appear in the neighborhood okay suppose i start with this bit okay suppose i'm interested in the neighborhood of this bit okay so to think of it on this tanner graph in a bipartite way itself you can say okay so this is let's say a 3 6 regular graph okay so 3 6 regular graph so i'll say the immediate neighbors of this bit node i'll put as the first three check nodes just for convenience okay so that i can show you how this neighborhoods will work out in the tanner graph okay those are my immediate neighbors maybe they actually appear, appear somewhere else in my original matrix but i can reorder them it's the same thing okay and then what will happen if i look at neighbors of this check node the first check node okay i can again write write them down as the next three next five bit nodes right the check node will have six total bit nodes connected to it okay degree six no six, three comma six so maybe i draw the i draw those five here okay is that clear i mean that's that's okay so likewise if you were to draw the neighbors of this check node okay one can imagine those things being here right okay all five appearing here likewise the neighbors of this check node maybe they appear here okay okay so this is one way of visualizing the neighborhood in the graph itself so now what will happen to the neighbors of this bit node the second bit node maybe you draw them here okay the two more maybe they appear here okay okay 
and then you can keep on continuing like this okay all the neighbors of these bit nodes will appear here and then those neighbors will come down here then further down to the right further down to the left likewise likewise like this the same thing i drew <coughs> in last class in a tree fashion okay but you can also visualize the neighbors on this graph itself by going to the right going to the left going to the right going to the left okay what will happen when you have repetitions you'll go back to something and that will immediately cause a loop okay you will have a closed path closed loop going back okay that's one more way of visualizing it all these things are important it's also possible to visualize neighborhoods on the matrix itself okay a little bit more difficult but how will you do it suppose i start with a particular bit how will i identify its neighbors on the matrix <coughs> the positions of the rows on which the first column has ones those are its neighbors check nodes that are connected to now what about the neighbors of those check nodes the columns where those rows have ones okay and then what about further neighbors you can go to each of those columns and come down okay it's a little bit difficult to visualize on the matrix but this is how you go you keep going column to row then row to column then row to column to row row to column so on and so forth and this is the same jump you're doing here okay so <coughs> anytime you have a repetition you will get a closed loop in the in the tanner graph okay a similar thing in the matrix is more difficult to visualize okay so there's no closed loop as such right so you will get something you know, i mean it's, it's, it looks like yeah you will come, come back to one of the same rows of columns okay but the structure itself doesn't have a very clear description like the cycle in the graph okay in the matrix it's a complicated way to describe okay so it's important that you think about the neighborhoods and you have a good good clear idea about what the neighborhoods are any questions something that's disturbing you both the way i write it down okay and when the result that i gave you that there will not be any short cycles is basically that as n becomes really really large if you hold wr and wc constant okay and increase n you will not get short cycles in fact i showed you can for any any l you can have neighborhoods of depth l being cycle free with very high probability okay that's possible as you get n becoming very very large okay so <coughs> we will use all this <coughs> as we go along okay any questions it's fine okay so let's move on to describe the gallagher <coughs> a decoder okay so this is the first decoder that we are seeing gallagher okay it's g a l a okay so this is a hard decision decoder what do i mean by a hard decision decoder yeah you first quantize to how many bits one bit so basically you are decoding on what channel even though you have a gaussian channel you are actually converting it into a bsc okay that is a very simple conversion that you are doing and then you are decoding on that so you can think of gallagher a decoder as a decoder which works on the bsc okay it's a simple <coughs> thinking about it it's a hard decision decoder okay there are several properties you will see the way we describe it you will many of these properties will become will become clear so first of all it's an iterative decoder okay almost all decoders for ltpc codes are iterative iterative in the sense <coughs> if you take for instance the reed solomon decoder you had several steps but you don't go back and revisit the same step over and over again right you do it and you move on okay and then finally you decode and you finish here what will happen is you will increasingly refine your decoding by repeating the same same steps over and over again okay so that's why it's iterative the same process is repeated several times okay and uh, you'll see in our analysis we will want to do a large number of iterations okay and uh, and even in some some in, in some simulations we can see that all that is all that will uh, all that will tend to be good okay so it's iterative in nature and it's described on the tanner graph it's easiest to describe on the tanner graph okay one can write down a very clear description even with the matrix it's not too difficult but it's not intuitive and it doesn't extend to other decoders very easily so but if we describe it on the tanner graph it becomes so clear and easy and simple to visualize what's going on okay later on i'll show you a visualization of the decoding on the matrix okay at that time i'll talk about what the connection is how the visualization is on the matrix itself but the description i'll do on the tanner graph okay 
all right so so okay so as i said description on the tanner graph so to be very specific let's say uh, we look at a wr comma wc regular ldpc code okay so this is what we'll fix okay i have not mentioned block length and how do you visualize that n is sufficiently large so that this matrix is sparse and everything will work out very well okay that's that's how you think of the uh, block length and suppose i already have a parity check matrix okay so I'm, i already have a parity check matrix i already have a tanner graph <coughs> okay so so what's my channel model my channel model is i'm transmitting a code word how did i get a code word i have to encode okay i have not talked about encoding that much okay so but you know it's a linear code you will have a generator matrix you will have a parity check matrix you can encode someone can potentially do it maybe it's complex maybe it's uh, not very simple but one can encode okay so i have somehow encoded this code word is being transmitted and i'll say it goes through a binary symmetric channel with probability of transition p and i get a received word r okay so this r is going to be r1 r2 so on till rn okay where n is my block length and this is my input to the decoder okay this is going to be run through a let's say the gallagher a decoder produce an estimate of the transmitted code okay this is how the picture looks okay so now i said i'm going to describe it on the tanner graph <coughs> each bit node of my tanner graph corresponds to a column of the parity check matrix and each column i can relate to a particular bit okay i have r1 through rn okay r1 is received when c1 was transmitted okay so that's the some of the thing okay so this is c1 through cn r1 was received when c1 was transmitted r2 was received when c2 was transmitted so on okay but r1 and r2 i clearly said are not independent right you remember the entire vector r are not independent if you given a particular code word then they become independent okay if you know what c1 are they independent otherwise <coughs> they are not independent so but but it's very usual to associate r1 to the first bit node of my tanner graph okay so what is that exactly r1 is immediately if i don't do any processing r1 is the best estimate i have for c1 okay is that clear okay so do you see that simple it's a very simple thing r1 is received when c1 is transmitted what is the probability that r1 equals c1 1 minus p and the probability p r1 will not be equal to c1 suppose if i am not allowed to do any processing what will be your best estimate for c1 <coughs> assuming p is less than 0.5 it will be r1 right you can't do anything more okay if you are not allowed to do any processing r1 will be your best estimate of c1 likewise r2 will be the best estimate of c2 okay you can't do anything better if you are not allowed to do any processing okay so it's very natural to associate r1 with bit node 1 r2 with bit node 2 and so on so that's as if that's the initial starting information you have about those corresponding bits okay so when i write down the tanner graph i'll put r1 r2 r3 so on next to those corresponding bit nodes okay so and one can imagine that is the best estimate you have for that bit node <coughs> okay at, at time zero when you when you have not really started doing any of your decoding okay so suppose if i were to put down the tanner graph okay i would say r1 is associated with this guy r2 is associated with this guy r3 is associated with this guy so on till rn which is associated with this guy okay right so what is my tanner graph the complicated set of connections all this is there okay and then i have a bunch of check nodes here okay that's my tanner graph okay <coughs> okay so like i said the procedure is iterative so iteration 1 is slightly different from the other iteration so we'll describe iteration 1 separately and then we'll go on and repeat the same steps over and over again okay so what's iteration 1 okay so all iterations can be described in a very simple statement almost all, all iterations that you do will try to send the best estimate or knowledge you have about a particular bit locally to its neighbors okay so for instance 
initially all these bit nodes are the only ones which have any information the other nodes don't have any information and what does bit node 1 have it has r1 which is its best estimate for what c1 is okay in any iteration a bit node will send some information to its neighbors okay well any node will send some information to its neighbors that's how the general philosophy is okay so for instance bit node 1 will be connected to how many other check nodes w wc no wr no wc oh so i've been doing wc wr okay i'm sorry correct me if i make these kind of mistakes this is what i've been writing down okay so 3 comma 6 is what we write okay so suppose bit node 1 is connected to wc check nodes okay so in the first iteration bit node is going to give the its best estimate of c1 to all its neighbors what is its best estimate of c1 r1 okay so it will send r1 to all its neighbors okay so iteration 1 is all bit nodes send okay let me be let me be very specific here i'm sorry let me not say all bit nodes let me say bit node i then it becomes easy okay bit node i sends what sends r i to its neighbors its neighboring check nodes okay so this is step a of iteration 1 okay in iteration 1 there is a step b as well okay so what is the step b so step a in step a what happened some information was sent from bit nodes to check nodes okay in step b of iteration 1 some information will be sent from check nodes to the neighboring bit nodes okay that's what will happen in uh, step b so it's a very simple procedure okay so every iteration has two steps in the first step some information is sent from bit nodes to the neighboring check nodes and in step b some information is step sent from check nodes to the neighboring bit nodes so all information passes only along the edges okay there's no information that will jump from one bit node to some other check node which is not connected to it immediately okay in every iteration and every step information will travel along the edges okay that's one way of visualizing that fact that see for instance when bit node i sends ri to all its neighbors you can visualize that ri as traveling on each of those edges okay the same ri is traveling on so many different edges okay so suppose if you have to write down a simpler picture for one bit node this is bit node i okay it's got ri as its input okay it's connected to how many check nodes wc check nodes okay you can you can visualize ri on each of these edges this is iteration 1 step a and this is what's happening in at all bit nodes all the bit nodes are doing these things so it's also parallel so you'll see these decoders are all parallel all the nodes can do simultaneously okay so it will work together okay so what's step b in iteration one check nodes have to do something okay so now let's let's see this process a little bit more closely okay so i'll draw a picture like this maybe i look at check node j <coughs> okay how many bit nodes is this connect is it connected to okay wc bit nodes okay wr okay thanks okay i don't know what they are they can be some uh, all kinds of numbers so i'll say this is bit node j1 this is bit node j2 so until bit node j w r is that fine okay i don't know what they are which means what was the received value here r j1 r j2 so until r j w r okay so too many subscripts here but i guess i need all of those to be very specific okay so in step a what would have happened <coughs> in step a what would have happened yeah so this check node would have received in step a okay it would have received what yeah receive r j 1 r j 2 so on till r j w r okay so now when it wants to send something back to bit node j 1 what is the principle what sh what should it send back it should send back its estimate of what bit j1 
could be right based on all the information that the check node has okay what is its best estimate of what bit j1 could have been okay best estimate as in what estimate it can calculate quickly okay sometimes we'll say maybe the best estimate is too difficult to calculate so i'll just give up and calculate what i can quickly calculate in this case in fact in the first iteration you can even do the best estimate what's the best estimate what is what is its best estimate based on all those things i mean okay well rj1 it has okay okay so you should start with rj1 it knows rj1 right so rj1 is an estimate but is there any point in sending back rj1 to bit 1 bit j1 there's no point why i got it from bit bit j1 so i know whatever i got from bit j1 i don't have to send back once again so you should be careful with that also when i said it's it's best estimate it's best estimate of extrinsic information whatever is extrinsic to bit j1 not not that i know not not information that bit j1 will already know okay rj1 it already knows or whatever j1 sent it already knows okay so this best estimate i have to rephrase slightly i should say the check node should estimate what bit j1 should be using all the information it obtained from the other neighbors not including j1 because if you include j1 then it's not not extrinsic anymore and then you are doing something repetitive which is probably not very useful okay so suppose i say you should not include rj1 what is what would you do to get an estimate for bit j1 from the other things yeah so you so you, what do you know what do you know what does the check node know the check node knows cj1 plus cj2 plus so on till cjwr was equal to what is equal to zero right at the transmitting end right the check node the check was satisfied at the transmitter and then these corresponding rjs were received when those cjs were transmitted so what would be your best estimate now can i say the xor of all the remaining rs okay can i say that yes. is that clear yes. any questions on this okay so what it will send on this link okay will be rj2 xor rj3 xor so on till rj wr okay so remember all the information is flowing see in step a the information flowed in this direction in step b what will happen it will flow in the opposite direction okay it will flow from check node to bit node so what should you do here for this guy rj1 xor rj3 right that's what you do rj1 xor rj3 xor so on till rj wr okay okay watch out for this and keep thinking about it i'm going to ask a slightly non trivial question next okay some you should be able to answer it okay so the next thing is for the I, so likewise you can do for everything and then the last step would be rj1 xor rj2 xor so on till rj wr minus 1 that clear it's quite simple <coughs> okay so if you were to implement this step if you want to try to implement this step very efficiently by minimizing the number of xors how many xors do you need to be able to compute all these messages okay so so you can be slightly smart right so you see the nature by in a way in which it comes brute force way of doing it is what wr minus 1 times wc no. times no i don't know wr minus 1 times wr is it get that they get that right or wrong is correct okay everybody is happy okay but that's bro that's that will waste a lot of computations okay so you can do it in how many steps yeah, 2 wr minus 1 it's possible to do that. okay so you do wr minus 1 for computing the overall parity and then xor with each of those guys which is another wr xor okay so you can simplify your computation so it's not too bad okay so it's no you're not doing wr squared you're only doing wr Uh, 2 wr uh, computations for it. okay so that's the first question which is slightly non trivial the next question is more non trivial for the first step okay what is the probability that your estimate was wrong for step a step a what is the probability that 
the estimate that was sent on a edge was wrong it's p do you agree it's p okay in step a it is p probability that ri not equal to ci which is p what is the probability now that one of these estimates is wrong yeah do the computation see if you can do the computation what's the probability that one of these estimates is wrong it's an important computation try to do the <coughs> okay assume the all zero code word was transmitted if you, if you want to simplify your calculations assume all zero code word was transmitted okay it turns out the probability does not change depending on what code word is it's got something to do with odd number of errors right so there is a nice simple expression you can write for odd number of errors in a bernoulli process Okay, so I'll write down the answer. Okay, so don't don't uh, try to waste some time later and try to derive it. It's very useful. The answer is one minus one minus two p to the power w r minus one divided by two. Okay, so try to derive this. It's not too difficult. It's basically what out of w r minus one received values. How many errors should you have? You should have an odd number of errors. Okay, and these are all independent. Okay, as I said, like I said, assume all zero code word is transmitted. These are all independent now. And when, what is the probability of one error occurring? P. Okay, odd number of errors will be what? You should do n c one p to the power one one minus p to the power n minus one plus well n is w r minus one in this case, right? So you have to do all that and add it up. How did I get such a simple expression finally? Some of odd 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 n n choose things can be written in this form, right? A plus b power n Minus a minus b power n will become what? <clears throat> Only odd odd uh, choices will be included. Okay. Then how did I get the one? P plus one minus p becomes one. Okay. This is one minus p minus p. It survives here. <clears throat> okay. So this is how it works out. <clears throat> okay. So this is the probability of error. Okay. So that's step B. Okay, so the first iteration is quite easy to describe. Now, in second iteration onwards, <coughs> okay, I'll say iteration L step A. Okay, so how am I going to do iteration L step A? Okay, so you'll see we'll be introducing suboptimal things beginning here. Okay, so very uh, just quick quick fire decisions that we can make just based on locally available information as opposed to trying to find optimal things okay so what's so a bit node okay okay so let me write down iteration l minus 1 step b first okay so in the previous the step b of the previous iteration what would have happened to this bit if this is say bit node i it would have received estimates from its neighbors okay so it has how many neighbors wc neighbors okay so maybe these are i1 i2 i w c okay it would have received some estimates i need some notation for those estimates it turns out whatever processing i do depends on those messages so i'm going to call them something okay so i'll call this uh, v1 v2 
BWC. Okay, remember these are all estimates of what bit I could have been. They are all estimates of what bit I could have been. Okay, so that's how that's how it was uh, done. Okay, so now I want to write down what happens in step A of iteration L. Okay, so I have this bit node. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so in this step, messages are going to be passed. So let me write down here, I'm sorry, just to be very precise, I'll say L minus 1 here because those were messages. Yeah, yeah. So the remark was that unless WR and WC are very small, all these computations will become fairly intensive. Okay, so you want to keep WR and WC very small compared to N. Okay, <coughs> okay? so the messages that are going to be passed back in step A of iteration L, once again will be estimates of what bit I could have been, I will call them U I U U1, I am sorry, U1 L, U2 L, so on, U W C L. Okay, so there is some logic to the to the step that I'm going to write down. Okay, so the um, logic that we're going to use to come up with U1 L. Okay, so I'll write it down and then ask you if it makes sense. Okay, so that's the that's what we're going to say. Okay, U1 L is going to be equal to Okay. Okay. Now let me write down the condition first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If v2 l minus 1 equals v3 l minus 1, so on till v w c l minus 1 equals some b, b which is what? 0 or 1, right? These messages are all binary, 0 or 1. Okay. If this, okay, this condition is satisfied, I'm going to set u and l to be b. Okay. Else, I'm going to say u and l is ri. Okay. So how do I find the message or the bit that goes from bit i to check node i1? I look at all the other messages that were received in the previous iteration. If all of them agree or all, all of them are equal, or if all of them are either all 0 or, or all 1s, then I would send that common value as my best estimate. In case there is any disagreement, I am going to say, I am going to say what? I am going to give up on everything and say I do not trust any of these guys. I only trust my, trust what came out of the channel and send RI once again. Okay. So that is the logic. It is clear, right? What, what I am going to do? So I look at all the other, other values. It's very clear that I should not use v1l minus 1, right? There's no point in using v1l minus 1. v1l minus 1 already I1 knew. It's what, what, what it sends. So I should not use that. I'm using all the other things, and when am I trusting all the other 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 messages or other bits that were received? When all of them agree. If they don't agree, I'm not going to trust them. I'm going to send RI itself directly. Does this make sense? Why does it make sense? Why can't we use majority is the question. Yeah, if you use majority, you get majority or use a threshold. Instead of saying only if all of them agree, say if at least so many of them agree, then I'll do it. Yeah, that's a better thing. That's actually called Gallagher's B algorithm, but we won't study it. Maybe I'll, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll do something with it later on. But Gallagher A, Gallagher A makes this choice. Okay, the choice is if any of them, if all of them are not the same, I'm going to send RI. Why am I trusting RI more? Is there any reason for why RA should be trusted more? Yeah. Well, dependency is not the only issue. But intrinsically, you should trust RA more. Why? Exactly. Probability of error for RA will be lower than probability of error for any of the other guys. Why? It's 1 minus 1 minus 2 p per. It will be much lower, much higher, much worse than the probability that you had with just p. Okay. So, RI you can trust more. See, how did you get the other messages? You exhort a lot of things which themselves could have been in error. So, there are so many more ways in which you could have gone wrong with the other things. 
but ri just came purely out of the channel with probability p okay so you can trust ri more okay so that's why this makes sense okay so but like mukundan was pointing out maybe you should have a threshold here instead of saying all of them agreeing okay that's possible and you can optimize over that threshold and get better performance it's gallagher b as we call it maybe we'll see it maybe we won't see it in detail later but gallagher a it's a very simple algorithm okay but you can see there is a lot of suboptimal ad hoc decision here okay right we have not done any optimal thing about look at looked at all the connections but what is the advantage of this it's not complex it's very simple right <clears throat> it's very easy if you can if you want to build a gate or write a program to implement this it's very very easy do you have a question you saying that we are not using the majority logic no 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 not necessarily that I mean, majority logic is not too complex compared to this okay this is just the starting point as i said it's gallagher a gallagher b is one can imagine is more involved than gallagher a analyzing that is a little bit more tough this is much easier to analyze Oh, I mean, both of them are quite simple decoders. They're not difficult. I'm gonna, I'm gonna slowly go there. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's again one of my principles. One of my principles was I'll only send extrinsic information. I will not send intrinsic information back to the check node. See, the check node already knew v1 l minus one. I will not use that in the extrinsic calculation. It's just a principle. You can violate it. In fact, you can design a decoder violating it. It'll be more difficult to analyze. It it might converge. It may not converge. It's difficult to do things. But the principle I've chosen is I will not send intrinsic information back. I'll only use pure extrinsic information in my iteration for my for calculating my messages. So this could uh, this could get into infinite. Yeah, it can very much. We'll show. You. We'll see. <coughs> we'll see slowly we'll look at uh, convergence and success and failure slowly okay we have not come to that yet right now i'm just describing the decoder it's hard enough to understand the <laughs> decoder very clearly okay okay so is this clear is this step clear okay hopefully is this clear it's clear it's, looks like people are okay so the best test of clarity is to do some computation with it and see if we can do it okay suppose i say each of the okay what about u2l how will i do u2l yeah if v1 l minus 1 equals v3 l minus 1 so i will not use v2 alone in that equation but i can repeat the same thing you see that right i'll write down exactly for just u2 alone if v1 l minus 1 Equals v3 l minus 1. So until v w c l minus 1 equals b, then you set u2 l equals b. Else you set u2 l equals r i. Okay, and one more thing which I have not mentioned explicitly, but it's clear. All check nodes have to do this. Okay, it's not enough. Just one check node doesn't. Okay, when you say i check node. all the check notes <coughs> have to do it and they can do all of them in parallel right theoretically if you have parallel processing possible all of them can happen at the same time okay this is clear no yeah yeah it will be oh totally overall the probability is better if you include both ri and these guys you'll get better probability right now i'm i'm trying to think of the next iteration okay after the first iteration i also have to make a decision on what my ci hat would have been okay i have not come to that slowly we'll come there there you'll see that will be better probable you'll include ri everything and you'll want to increase your probability <coughs> see a parity you see that is very easy to imagine if you if you do x x uh, a x or b a can be in error b can be in error right with the same probability A X or B will be poorer, right? Because both of them can be an error. You're doing an X or anything. Several things can go wrong. <coughs> so it's a very natural thing. But if you use all the information together, you'll you'll get some gain. Okay. Okay. So the computation I want you to do is the following. Okay. Suppose I say, assume all zero code word was transmitted and all that for simplicity. Okay. Suppose I say probability that any of the V I at the L minus one iteration are an error is some. QL. Okay, so I'm going to define a QL now. What is QL? 
probability that v l minus 1 equals is an error okay what do i mean by error if all zero code word is transmitted all zero code word implies error in v l minus 1 if if what v l minus 1 equals 1 okay if it is equal to 1 then there is an error otherwise it's not an error okay <coughs> So if you go back and look at the first iteration, at the end of the first iteration, right, we had the same probability for any of the vi's to be in error. So I can drop the subscript there and simply say v l minus 1 and ql is the probability that v l minus 1 is an error. Okay. I want you to compute the probability that u l will be in error. Okay. So I will call that as p l probability that u l equals 1 okay this is the probability that i want you to compute okay remember again all zero code word has been assumed okay so when i say error it is u l equals 1 <coughs> okay i want you to compute p l in terms of q l and p okay you will need both try to compute that it's a simple probability calculation but Okay, assumes all assume that all those v i l minus 1s are all independent assume they are all independent and identically distributed 1 with probability q l 0 with probability 1 minus q l okay now we have to find the probability that u l equals 1 <coughs> Yeah, yeah, assume independence of VIs. Assume all the VIs are independent and identically distributed. Please assume for now and calculate. We will we'll show you when they will be independent, then we will argue it out. Okay. Assume all the VI L minus 1 are independent and identically distributed, 0 with probability 1 minus QL, 1 with probability QL. actually a very simple calculation but you have to get your head around it that's all <laughs> what is pl okay so it will be okay so there are two cases right ri could have been in error and ri okay so suppose ri is received correctly okay so what is that probability 1 minus p if R i is received correctly, what is the only way in which U L, which R i is received correctly means what? R i is 0. What is the only way in which can I get U L to be equal to 1? All of them are in, are equal to 1. Okay, W C minus 1 of them should be equal to 1. Is that right? So, what should I write here? Q L power W C minus 1. Is that fine? Everybody is happy with that? Okay. On the other hand, if R i was equal to 1, <coughs> yeah, they should not all be 0. That is the only thing. What is that probability? 1 minus 1 minus Q L power W C minus 1. Do you see that? Do you agree with me? This is my formula for P L in terms of Q L and Okay, what were the various assumptions? Okay, list down all the assumptions that were done when I wrote down this nice and simple formula. Without those assumptions, it is not possible. The first assumption by which it was so easy was I assumed all zero code word. Okay, so it's so crucial. If I did not assume all zero code word, what will happen? I have to keep saying UL is in error. Okay, and UL is in error could mean R I was zero, R I was one. There's just too many complications, right? Maybe you can write it down. It's not a big deal, but it was simplified very nicely. By, by saying that I can assume it was the 
all zero code word okay that was a crucial thing the next thing was what all these v i l minus 1 are identical and independent okay both of those are also both that is also a very very crucial assumption without that you can't do that i have to come back and justify all those assumptions i will do that later on i'll say why those things are reasonable and for large n why they won't matter okay so i'll make i'll justify those later on but for now at least these computations we can believe okay is that clear okay so now let's move on to step b of iteration l s So you're saying this one minus p should not come. See, this been uh, this question always comes when I write this down. <laughs> okay, maybe we can talk about this uh, outside of class. Okay, so it should. Uh, I've seen I've seen an expression written like this. So it it, it has to work like this. I think I think it's correct. We'll see. Okay. Anyway, maybe maybe there is some bug here. If there is a bug, I'll come back and correct it. I know I have the right version somewhere. I can dig it out. Okay, I think this is fine. Okay, we'll see. Okay, but it's okay. I mean, the exact form and the correctness of the expression is okay. I mean, you, we can check it later. But the philosophy is what when you make all these assumptions, you can compute probability of error involving QL. Okay, it's very important. This will come later on. Okay, when we analyze this, these expressions will be very very crucial. Okay, all right. So now let me write down step B. Okay, so all these expressions not being exactly the same is okay in the class, but it's not okay when you write a quiz. Okay, when you write an exam. <laughs> <laughs> answer has to be exact. You can't say all this is irrelevant and all that. Okay, it is unfortunately true. But you have to keep that in mind. It's the advantage of teaching as opposed to writing exams. Okay, so step B, <coughs> step B is actually the same as step B for iteration one. Okay, it's not very different, but I'll write it in the most general case. Okay, the most general case. If I look at check node J, it's connected to say bit nodes J1, J2, so on till j w r okay again i have to actually write down step a okay in step a what would have happened it would have received some things okay so for that i need some notation so i'll say this is step a okay so let's suppose that what was received is u1 l u2 l okay notice there'll be a clash in notation here and uh, that's the best way in which i can denoted otherwise if we keep changing the notation being very careful it will just get too messy and unnecessary okay so i'll say the messages that flew uh, that came from the different bit nodes to a particular check node j in it step a of iteration l where u1 l through u w r l okay so what happens in step b what would you do in step b it's very easy yeah take the xor of remaining bits for each one bit Okay, so that's what you do. Okay, so let me write that down formally. Okay, so what goes back here would be U2L XOR, U3L XOR, so on till XOR, UWR, L. Okay, so likewise you can do it. I'll write the last one alone U1L XOR u 2 l xor u w r minus 1 l okay so clean that's what goes back to r j 1 r j 2 r j from check node j okay it's the same as <coughs> before yes Yeah, I think so. Right. Okay, so so that that question was about the validity of the previous expression. Okay, so I think people are still obsessed about it in spite of my lecture about why it's not so consequential, why it why it should be inconsequential. But anyway, if you're thinking about it, it's fine. Okay, all right. So 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 so. so. By the way, did you understand what she said? No. Not clear. She's saying that P into QL power WC minus 1 actually occurs on the right hand side. 
right? Is that what you're saying? And it will get added to this, and eventually it will become okay. Anyway, but doesn't matter. It's okay. Let's let's not worry about it. Let me not obsess with it too much. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to uh, things that really matter. It's just okay. Now I want you to redo the calculation now <coughs> for this part. Now again, assume that each of these UIs will be in error with probability p n. Okay, that that we already know. Okay, probability of error for each of the UIs that are coming in. Will be P L. Okay. Now imagine that each of these cases are what V one L. Okay, this is what's going back here. V two V two L. Exactly. Okay, V W R L. Okay, these are the messages that are going back. Now we have to compute the probability that V I will be in error or V I will be equal to one, assuming all zero code word. Okay, what will you get? You'll get a very similar expression to what I got before, and that can be easily done. So you see, Q. Okay, so I think I I made I made a slight goof here. Okay, so I should actually call this Q L minus one. Okay, only then will I get something reasonable here. Apologize very profusely for this, because this concerns V L minus one. I don't know why I called it Q L. Okay, so this should all be minus one. Okay, apologize for that. So it makes sense to put minus one here. Is that fine? Okay. So I'm sorry for that. Now I can write down Q L will be equal to what? One minus one minus two P L raised to the power W R minus one divided by Okay, so this is the probability that V L equals one. So now, not only have I given you a description of the algorithm. Okay, now based on this description, you can you can go back and given a parity check matrix, you can write a simple program to implement this decoding algorithm. Right? It's very easy. Just keep doing this over and over again. Is it easy? Easy? Okay, try, you should try writing it. Okay, so it's a very interesting algorithm to try to code. Okay, you all you have to do is what? Have an algorithm to generate Parity check matrix. How, how will you generate a parity check matrix? You can use Gallagher's construction. Pick a suitable n, do Gallagher's construction. You'll get a parity check matrix. Then generate the all-zero code word. Introduce errors according to some probability p. Okay. Then write a program to implement this decoding algorithm. You can do that. Not only can you do that, you can also analyze up to some assumptions. What are the assumptions? The big assumption of being independent and identically distributed. By up to that assumption. you can also analyze you can find pl and ql as l increases okay so i can in fact write down one iteration for pl as a function of p l minus 1 okay for l equals 1 2 so on and p0 is what i can set it to p <coughs> okay well it will actually go through q but it's okay i mean i can write it as one big function if i want okay so so the probability of error can also be analyzed in a very nice way okay so go back and contrast this with the bitwise map decoder and ml decoder we had optimal wonderful decoders but what did we have to do to even think about analyzing we had this complicated expression for which you have to find pdf okay here we are able to make some approximations i'll justify the approximation soon enough We're able to make some ID approximations, and we're able to write down probability of error analysis as a very nice recursion. Okay, so now we have to prove some properties for this recursion. For instance, what would be a desirable property for this recursion? It should decrease, right? So PL should be a monotonically decreasing sequence. Okay, try to prove it. It can be proved based on this iteration. Okay, it's a complicated thing. You'll have to do some careful proof, but at the end of the day, it's only real analysis. It's only nice, smooth functions. There's nothing. Very nasty going on. It's polynomials. You can prove it. You can show that PL will be a monotonically decreasing uh, sequence. Okay, according to this iteration, should get that. Okay, what what can happen possibly to monotonically decreasing sequences as L L in L tends to infinity? It's also positive, right? It's greater than zero. It's bounded away from the negative infinity. So now, when it monotonically decreases, what can happen? Only two things can happen. 
Well, only one thing can happen. It has to converge, right? It has to converge. It cannot escape convergence because it's bounded below at zero, and then it is decreasing. So it has to converge. Only thing is, it can converge away from zero. It can con converge to a non-zero value. Okay. So those two cases are of interest to us. Will this sequence converge to zero, or will this converge to some non-zero value? Why is it of any importance to us? Well, that's the probability of error, and you want it to converge to zero. Okay. Okay, so what is this probability of error for? Probability of error for the message that goes from bit node to check node at iteration L. Okay, is the, is it enough if that is zero? Yes. Yeah, that's that's it's enough, right? If that is zero, then yeah. what will become zero? I haven't told you how to make decisions yet. Okay, right? You have to ask that question. So how do you make a decision after iteration L? Okay. Yeah. So. That is also important. Decision after iteration L. Okay, I don't want to write down something explicit here. You can use a reasonable rule. Maybe you use majority logic. Okay, what is majority logic? You have R i and then what? V one, V two through V W C. Okay, right? After iteration L, for bit no bit i. All the information you have is what R i, and then you have v1 l minus 1. Am I right? No, v1 l. No, v1 l minus 1. Did I get that right? L minus 1, right? Yeah, l minus 1. V2 l minus 1. Yeah, at iteration 1 you don't have anything. Okay, so am I getting this right or wrong? Should be l or l minus 1. <coughs> Yeah, after iteration. Okay, so it will be L, no? Yeah, I wrote after here, man. Clearly. So, so clearly it should be L. Okay. So maybe you make a majority vote, or maybe you give more preference for R I. Okay, it's okay. I mean, I can come up with some reasonable rule. Okay. So maybe majority decision. Okay. So C I hat equals majority of R I V one L. VWC L. Okay. If PL equals zero, then you are guaranteed that the majority decision will be correct. Okay. So it's enough if you force PL to zero, your decision will automatically become accurate. Okay. <coughs> so this is a decision you can do after iteration L. You can't make sure. So what you do in practice is the question was how do you make sure that C cap equals so maybe I put a L here C cap L which is equal to C1 cap L C2 cap L Cn cap L you can make all these decisions fine but will it be a code word or not that's the question you have to ask okay you won't know if it's a code word or not how will you find out if it's a code word or not multiply with h times C transpose, see if it goes to zero. Okay, so what people do in practice is, if the number of iterations is not a problem, you keep on iterating till you get a code word after a particular, thing. and you have a absolute maximum number. You have like hundred, at which you give up and stop. Say okay, after I've not got a code word now, maybe I'll never converge to a particular code. Word. <coughs> so in practice, you have to use all those uh, things to when you write a program and let it decode. Okay. So the first thing I want to tell you is this can get very complicated. Okay, so you have thousands of bit nodes. Okay, all these messages flowing back and forth. Okay, the only handle you have to analy analyzing it is this PL. And PL calculation of this PL involves an approximation which says I've assumed all these things are IID. If there is any repetition in my neighborhood, right? If there is any repetition in my neighborhood, you will start getting dependence. Why? Because the same bit nodes are coming from different places, okay. But if up to depth L, if there are no repetitions in my neighborhood, what does it mean? Up to iteration L, my calculation for PL is valid, okay. It's not wrong, okay. So this is the connection. This is where everything comes together, okay. Okay. If in my neighborhood, up to depth L. I don't have any repetition, or what is it in terms of cycles in the Tanagraph? 
if there are no cycles of length 2L or lower in my Tanner graph, my decoding will be accurately analyzed up to iteration L by this IID assumption. Okay, so it's a very simple statement to make at the end of the day, but hopefully you saw all the all the directions that it took, and finally we came came up to one very nice uh, very nice statement. Okay, so that's the next last thing I want to write down. Okay, so the length of the uh, cycle minimum is length of the cycle becomes important. Okay, if there are no cycles of length 2L or lower in the Tanner graph. Okay, one has to say to be very careful that. The analysis by PL by the IID assumption is accurate. In fact, in, if you see the literature, most people will say decoding is accurate. Okay. <laughs> right? Can't say if decoding is accurate or not. Okay, after iteration L, the analysis through this IID assumption is accurate. Okay, decoding might still be in error after iteration L. Okay, there's no guarantee for any such thing. Okay, so watch out for that. Okay, I'll say IID assumption for analysis. I, I, I assumption holds up to iteration L. Okay. Now, what did I say about sparse graph as n tends to infinity? Right. For any L, as long as you keep increasing n, probability that in the random code you selected from this ensemble of all possible WRWC codes, you will get cycles of length 2L or lower is going to be very very small okay out of these so many codes that you have in this ensemble the one that you randomly pick will have very low probability of having a cycle of length 2l for any l as long as you make n large enough it falls i think quite rapidly with n okay so the probability is going to fall very rapidly so what does it mean the iid assumption is going to hold with very high probability for large n okay so that's the next thing IID assumption <coughs> holds with high probability for any L, any finite L as N, I'll say it tends to infinity as, as long as N is large enough. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, of block length n. Uh, uh, well, typical. What depends on what typical is. Okay, so for instance, if you look at the WiMAX standard, which uses LDPC codes, the value of n ranges from 24 times 24. What is it? 576. 576 to 24 times 96, which is I believe uh, 2304. Okay, so 576 to 2300. That's what they use in WiMAX because in wireless you can't use very large block lengths, right? You have to be short block length. There's all kinds of problems in wireless. So, so that's what they use. Okay. So in practice, if you say typical is what is done in practice, then that is. The thing. But if you have another channel, for instance, if you have deep space communication, they really don't care about block length. You can keep going on and on forever. Maybe you tend your block length to a large number, okay, and then hope to get better and better uh, performance. <coughs> okay. All right. So, this five more minutes, I'm going to make one more statement. Okay. So, what people do is, I've, I've made this statement about this recursion, PL equals f of PL minus one. Okay. It's a monotonically decreasing sequence, and I said we have to distinguish between two cases: the case where that sequence converges to zero, and the case there where that sequence does not converge to zero. It turns out there is a very sharp cutoff for P, which determines that. Okay. Okay, that's what is called the threshold. Okay, so threshold. Okay, is p star, which is a transition probability. Okay, for p less than p star, p l uh, tends to. Uh, zero 
and for p greater than p star pl will tend to infinity it turns out this is valid for that iteration that we had what is the iteration that we had pl equals f of pl minus 1 so how will you test whether this is valid or not fix some wr and wc okay so fix it to be 3 comma 6 okay start with different p naughts p naught is p right remember p naught is p and then do that iteration maybe in matlab or something and see if pl tends to zero well not infinity i'm sorry <laughs> tends to some <laughs> uh, it's quite funny finite value thanks <coughs> yeah so it will be less than 1 it not not be zero it's not zero it's bounded away from zero it will converge to say 0 0.001 it will never go below that <coughs> okay okay so it turns out this also can be shown for that iteration think about how how you will prove something like this for that iteration okay can you prove something like this i don't know it's possible by simulation yeah we can easily calculate this by simulation one can easily compute the p star right so what will this p star be a function of wr and wc do you see that there's nothing else involved in that okay so p star will be a function of wr and wc why because your iteration itself changes right in one you multiply by raise it to the power wr minus 1 raise it to the power wc minus 1 and all the iteration itself changes but all these properties are true it's always true that irrespective of wr and wc their iteration is monotonically decreasing Okay, it's also true that irrespective of WR and WC, you always have a threshold probability below which your PL will tend to zero. Okay, and you can compute this P star by doing this iteration repeatedly in, in simulation very very easily. It's easily computable. Okay, now notice this P star actually tells you something about probability of error when what all should you tend to infinity now? for this p star to be actually a probability of error or this p the well well you see you see where it uh, okay so let me be careful okay so for this p star to have any meaning in practice okay that's what i should say it's not probability of error for this p star to have any meaning in practice what all should i tend to infinity first of all i should tend l to infinity right i can make a statement like if i have a particular code this code will work with zero probability of error for p less than p star and it will work with non-zero probability of error for p greater than p star if i have to make that statement then what all should i do i should tend l to infinity first okay just because i'm tending l to a large value what should go to infinity also n should also go to infinity so this threshold is asymptotic in both senses it's asymptotic in block length and number of iterations okay you do more and go to a larger and larger block length and do more and more iterations this p star will control the behavior of your LDPC code. What will happen? For p less than p star, you will get zero probability of error. It will drop. Okay. For p greater than p star, you will get a non-zero probability of error. And this will be more and more effective as block length increases and number of iteration increases. Okay. Let me illustrate that with one plot. Okay. So, <coughs> Okay, so this is the plot <coughs> hopefully you can see it so so i'm not i'm not importing it into windows journal maybe maybe you can add it later so 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 this is a plot of simulation okay so this is purely simulation there is no analysis here i have done simulation for br bit error rate versus transition probability of can you read it transition probability for a binary symmetric channel and can you read the title what does it say 36 regular ldpc codes with gallagher a decoding maybe you can't read the legend very clearly the different curves are for increasing block length i start with block length 30 then i go to block length 100 then i go to block length 1000 then i go to block length 10000 okay and threshold which is purely a function of 3 and 6 which I have calculated by doing all the simulations, trying out the iteration and seeing when it converges to zero and seeing when it doesn't converge to zero. Okay, the point at which the transition happens is 0 0.04 for 
three comma six regular codes. Okay, you can stare at it for a while and convince yourself. While threshold theoretically results from tending block length to infinity and number of iterations to infinity, is very practical in predicting the performance. Okay, in fact, can you guess how many iterations I would have done for this? I did only ten iterations. Okay, I did ten iterations, and for block length even maybe one thousand. you can see that behavior to the right side of threshold what happens you get a non zero probability and what happens immediately as soon as it crosses the threshold it's a big cascade okay so it's a waterfall type behavior okay it drops down and for 10000 it becomes more pronounced it's constant for a while and then around that 0.4 0.04 it's taking a sharp dive down can you see that why is it behaving towards the left hand side why is that was importing with respect to transition probability you might be used to snr which improves as you move to the right this is transition probability which decreases as you move to the right so it it behaves like this okay so it's a little bit inverted l is only 10 my number of iterations is only 10 in this plot okay <coughs> so you see even for small number of iterations and reasonable block lengths okay 1000 10000 one might say is not too unreasonable okay threshold is quite an accurate predictor for actual behavior across the channel okay so what does this mean it means all the assumptions you made all those probabilities are falling very fast with them okay that's why even for small n all these things tend to hold and even for small l these things tend to hold so that pl is converging very fast when it wants to go to zero it goes to zero very fast okay <coughs> so all those things are happening okay so that's why uh, this threshold while while we made all those assumptions fantastic assumptions in the in the analysis is very valid in practice even for block length 30 okay well block length 30 it's really bad okay i'll admit it's just a straight line falling down but block length 30 maybe maybe you don't care too much okay but even block length 30 notice how remarkable it is okay i'm doing 10 iterations and what is this point okay so this point here can you see it can you see my cursor moving around that point the probability of error is what 2 times 10 to the power minus 3 0.002 and what's the probability of output bit error it's below 10 to the power minus 4 okay so it's doing fine you know i mean it's not it's not too terrible in terms of just if you just think of it in terms of raw behavior maybe you can't expect anything more from a rate half code with block length 30 okay maybe anyway, i'm sure there are better codes than this just giving you an idea okay for larger and larger block length Imagine how remarkable it is for the 10,000 code. It's a 5,000 by 10,000 parity check matrix. Okay, I want you to step back and imagine how non-trivial this decoding is. Can you imagine doing any other decoding for that code? It's not possible, right? It's just a random code that I constructed with an LDPC code. I'm able to decode it and show you a plot for block bit error rate going down to 10 to the power minus 5. Okay, which means how many blocks would I have simulated? In fact, for this, I simulated 100,000 blocks. Okay. in matlab it takes about maybe i don't know 1 minute 2 minutes less than that okay so that's the that's the remarkable nature of all the things that have gone into the design of ldbc codes into the decoding into the analysis so it all comes together in this plot as far as i'm concerned okay we did a lot of things we did a lot of assumptions but at the end of the day for long block lengths ldbc codes can be made to work and reasonably long block lengths not that too not that very long and it's low complex it's implementable it's wonderful okay and there's no wonder that they are uh, out there okay and the, and now you if you remember capacity what was capacity for rate half bsc 0.11 right 0.11 is capacity threshold is 0.04 here okay right even if i tend n to infinity as long as i keep my 3 comma 6 i can never be better than threshold right i'll, I'll never tend to zero better than threshold okay so this 0.04 kind of limits me okay i can so what should i do now what should i try to do now i should try to design ldpc codes for which thresholds will in this picture move to the right <coughs> right maybe rate half ldpc codes for which threshold is very very close to 0.11 can we do that is one question okay okay so you'll see naturally you'll have to go to codes that are called irregular codes for that okay and that means more more careful study you know okay so that's the direction in which we'll move okay so i thought i'll show you an animation but we don't have time i'll return your answer papers i'll show you the animation uh, in the next class
okay i'm sorry